I don't think I've ever been so relieved to see something boot. But getting to this stage, well, it took quite a bit longer than I was expecting. I did initially start recording all the fault finding process that I was going through, but after several hours into it, I just put the camera away to concentrate on trying to get this thing up and running. First thing to note though, is that my battery finally arrived. So I went for a brand new Varta, 3.6 volt. Yes, I know most people would go for a new coin cell, but we don't have a lot of space around here. Plus I wanted to keep this little board looking as stock as possible. I've just went for this. Yes, it probably will leak at some point in the future, but I could keep an eye on it and we're talking years away so I'm not too worried. Now some of the viewers of the last video thought that the lack of riser card here might have been the issue. So I managed to find one. But this riser card as you can see has absolutely nothing special about it. We just have a connector on the bottom for the pins. And then that is straight up onto the three ISA slots and there is absolutely nothing else on this. Plus, as you've seen at the start, the machine boots up fine without it installed. By the end of the last video, I had myself fairly convinced that the issue lay with how I was connecting up the floppy drive. And I thought possibly some of the jumpers on the board might be related to that. Well, I was sort of right. These jumpers over here, believe it or not, are the ones related to the floppy drive. No, it wouldn't be these ones right beside it. It's these ones on the far side of the board. And I discovered that while tracing the pins off this floppy connector back to this controller, some of them get rooted via this. I have drew a little schematic of how this is all wired up and we'll take a look at that on the computer shortly. But the problem that was stopping it from booting actually turned out to be cracked solder joints on this little board here. I have seen pictures of this motherboard online that do not have this. So I can only assume that my motherboard here is an earlier revision and this was added at the factory to fix some mistake. There's four wee patch wires there running out to various locations. And there's also a pin header has been soldered in here. It was the connections on that had cracked. Reflowed that and away it went. You have no idea how many hours it took before I noticed that. In fact, I've been working on this board for so long that I'd actually given up on it at one point. But we can't let anything beat us here on CRG, so we persevered and then found the most obvious of faults, cracked solder joints. Anyway, as I was saying, I did manage to figure out how these jumpers work in relation to the floppy drive. So let's jump on the computer and take a look at the little schematic I've drawn. So this is my schematic for the wiring of the floppy system on the motherboard. We have the two floppy connectors the controller, and then the block of jumpers. I know these jumpers sit away off to the left hand side of the controller on the motherboard, but I've just drawn them here in the middle because that's how they sit electrically. Most of the pins are wired together and then through to the controller. The only thing that goes through the jumper block, as you might expect, is motor enable A, drive select B, drive select A, and motor enable A. In their standard configuration like this. Motor enable A and drive select A are wired through to motor on 2 and drive select 2. Likewise, drive select B and motor enable B is wired through to drive select 1 and motor on 1. You can reconfigure these jumpers easily to change that around as you wish. Interestingly though, the bottom connector here 
has no connection through to the controller. And pins 10 and 14 are not connected. It's only 12 and 16 that are, which are drive select B and motor enable B. It is possible on the jumper block to rewire drive B away from this connector here, just through to this connector. I honestly have no idea why they did it like this, because in its standard configuration, the way it's done here, you can just use a cable with two floppy connectors on it, and as long as there's a twist in the wire, it works fine. This connection up here, which carries density select from pin two, as well as this standard connection here, which runs from the second floppy connector, pins 12 and 16. They go up to this chip, which sits up beside the BIOS. This is a 74LS38, and to be perfectly honest with you, I have no idea what any of this is doing. Hopefully someone will find this wee schematic useful. I'll stick a link to a PDF document that shows this, in the video description. So the question remains, what are we gonna do with this motherboard? Unfortunately, I don't have the case and I don't really see myself getting one just because the M290S that this is out of seems to be quite rare. I was able to get the riser though, as I said, and I actually got this from the guy that gave me the board originally. And I did ask, no, he doesn't have the case. But when I was up getting this from him, I noticed in a junk pile, one very familiar looking connector. This is what's left of the old power supply that would have been in the case with this motherboard. He's removed the fan from it. That's easy enough to fix. We can always stick another fan in. But as you might be able to tell from some of the corrosion, this uh, power supply has seen better days. I've already been in here before, just to note down the different capacitors that we need to replace because, well, practically every one of them has leaked. This one here is particularly bad, but all of these have in fact spilled their guts, including most of the small ones. And you'll notice three resistors are missing from here because, well, that's what's left of them. The fuse had also exploded and quite violently too, because it was in bits. So something has gone in here, taking out these resistors at the same time. Unfortunately, the replacement capacitors have not arrived yet, or we could have swapped them out today. But at least that'll give me the chance to try and figure out why those three resistors exploded as well, along with that fuse. And then we'll return to this at some point in the future and hopefully build ourselves a good power supply for our motherboard. Now, I can fully appreciate that listening to me speak for the last nine and a half minutes does not exactly make for the most interesting of videos. So, let's get everything hooked up again to our motherboard. But this time, we'll also try and hook up this old hard drive. We'll see about getting a copy of MS-DOS installed because while researching this board online, I also came across a very interesting little program that I want to show you. Now this motherboard is restricted to 20, 40 or 100 megabyte hard drives. 
This is the smallest hard drive I have. This is 170 megabytes. Well, the smallest spur hard drive I have, but hopefully it'll work. Well, unfortunately that didn't work. Oh well, I suppose I'll just have to pull the 40 megabyte hard drive out of our other 286 build. Hard drives are overrated anyway. Let's just do this the old fashioned way. I've hooked up two floppy drives. We'll boot the DOS on one of them and I'll write a disk with a software on it for the other. Writing files over FTP direct onto a floppy is fun. DOS boot disk. Right, so what is this bit of software I've been dying to show you? Well, it's almost like a presentation taking you through the features of the M290S. And it doesn't work. Why does it not work? This worked fine in DOSBox. Let's just try and type that command. There we go. Seems to be working okay now. So I think this is pretty awesome and I will stick a link to this in the video description below and you can have a play with it yourself. Let's just take a quick look shall we? First time users. What the M290S is, how the M290S works, and main menu. What is an M290S? We have a monitor, a system module, and a keyboard. Hmm. System module. This is your computer's system -E module. As you know, this is the power switch. Well, probably, considering you were meant to be running this on your M290S. This is the space for the hard disk unit. On the left hand side, by removing the panel you gain access to. Come on floppy disk, the suspense is killing me. Ooh, animations. And we get access to the expansion slots. All three of them. This is the rear panel of the system -E module. For further information, press the key indicated. We have to get further information, don't we? Parallel interface. Serial interface. Keyboard interface. Hopefully you have already figured that out by this point. And mouse interface. The M290S accommodates up to three magnetic peripherals. Your M290S has a hard disk unit with a capacity of 20, 40 or 100 megabytes. No it doesn't. And that's all we get on system module. So this little bit of software is absolutely awesome. I can confidently say if I had had something like this back in the day on my first Packard Bell, I would have thought I knew everything about computers after learning it inside out. 
but it does take quite a while to get through it so I'll not bore you right now with any more of it. Instead what I'll do is I'll stick a link to this in the description below so you can download it and have a play with it yourself. It works fine in DOSBox so that's probably the easiest way to try it out. Well there we have it, that's the board booting off disk anyway. It's just a shame I don't have a hard drive that's compatible with it. Oh well. Comes back to that question, what are we going to do with this motherboard? I don't think I'm ever going to get the case. Not unless I find a 290S with a dead motherboard, possibly from a bad battery leak or something, but it's very unlikely. I do have the riser and I do have that power supply that needs fixed up so with all that perhaps I could make my own case. It is a very attractive looking board as I said after all. I just love the layout of it with all the traces and all the vias on it. It just looks really nice. So perhaps a clear acrylic case that might look quite cool but if I am going to do that it's going to have to wait for quite a while because unfortunately the guy I use for all my custom acrylic stuff is well currently furloughed not working because of the lockdown so I think for now I'll just stick this board away and we'll keep it for a future project at least it all works that's it for now then thanks very much for watching if you enjoyed this video I would appreciate a big thumbs up as it does help the channel why not check out some of my other videos if you haven't done so already and hit subscribe. Always plenty more content here to come in CRG and I'll see you next time.